Hi everyone and welcome to the second Fishing Tales podcast which, like the first, you can choose how to listen or watch. The audio version of the pod is available on Spotify and other podcast platforms while the deluxe version, which includes stills and video clips as well as the audio, can be seen on my YouTube channel, Matt Hayes Fish. So sit back, put your rod on the rest and listen to some more flotsam and jetsam from my fishing world. I'll be looking back at the recent floods and what it means for fishing. The Duke's back with every picture tells a story with his recollections of that iconic moment when he caught a 44 pound carp when we were filming for our fishing TV series. Now, as you know, the Duke and myself are the best of angling friends and it got me thinking about friends in fishing and how much they really contribute to your enjoyment of the angling journey. I'm lucky enough to have several really good fishing pals and I'll be lifting the lid on which of them have really influenced my fishing lifestyle and career. You might also like to think about your fishing mates and which among them that you might choose if you are challenged to a really difficult fishing competition by another team. And last but not least, we'll be going dark later on when I read a chapter from my book of fishing stories, Red Letter Days. No pictures for this section, just my retelling of one of my favourite fishing sessions. The last going dark was really popular and it was great to hear that you were listening at bedtime, at work, in trucks, taxis and of course while bivvied up on the bank. I like that one best of all. But first, since the first part, I've been busy attending the Northern Angling Show in Manchester and I've also been out fishing a few times with my good friend the Duke of Market Deeping. I don't know about you, but simply finding somewhere to fish has been a nightmare recently. The flooding in the UK over the back end of the winter, normally my favourite time to be out on my home rivers, was fraught to say the least. I've lived by the Severn for many, many years, and this year's floods have been the worst I've seen for a very, very long time. It seems that in the future, flooding is only going to get worse, which will only serve to make winter fishing even more unpredictable. Even still waters are being affected by flooding, with rivers bursting their banks and flooding into lakes and turning the landscape into a giant floodplain. And yet fish can still be caught in extreme flood conditions, if you know where to go. The scenes on the River Severn during a flood are nothing short of astonishing. Filthy brown water invades floodplains and properties with relentless force, which even flood defences are now struggling to cope with. While the water's rising, fishing is usually poor, and the fish are often more concerned with finding shelter than feeding. Yet, as the floodwaters peak and begin to fall, a window of opportunity opens up. If you're going to fish in flood conditions, it's wise to think about what you'll fish for. Certain species, for example, respond better in coloured water than others. Barbel are happy in flood water than chub, for example, and zander are much better filthy water feeders than pike and perch. As the water begins to drop and the colour starts to run out, fishing can be brilliant, and so timing your approach, if you have that luxury, is very advisable. Fishing the runoff will open up great fishing for roach, dace, chub, bream, perch and pike, as well of course as the barbel and zander. Finding fish when the river is in flood is the most important skill, because you can't catch fish that aren't there. So what are you looking for? The first thing to do is to walk the river and have a good look at the whole stretch, and I do mean the whole stretch if you can. Try to imagine what the bank looks like under the water. If you're familiar with this stretch, that's going to be much easier. What you're looking for is a firm, fairly even riverbed away from snags. If you're familiar with the stretch, try to picture swims that might be too shallow in normal conditions, but could be ideal with extra water on. Now, several years ago, I caught some cracking barbel from the Warwickshire Avon, fishing the flood in swims that were far too shallow in normal water conditions to hold fish. They were literally bereft of them. And yet, in a flood, the fishing on the cattle drink could be absolutely amazing. Try to find a swim with smooth, steadily flowing water, around walking pace. Back eddies where the water swirls and flows in contrary directions are usually unproductive, so try to find water that's going in one direction. Truly slack water's fine. It's a very good option, as long as you can avoid difficult currents and eddies. 
Depth isn't so important in a flood. Fish will happily sit on a shallow plateau in flood water that may even be dry under normal conditions. You know, I once caught a chub in a flood from underneath an apple tree at the bottom of my mum and dad's garden. The seven had burst its banks and was carrying around 15 feet of extra flood water. Yes, 15 feet. And fish can be caught in those conditions, as I've proved many, many times. So I was literally fishing on our lawn, ledgering a lump of cheese paste. Now, slacker water can generally be found in the area behind flooded bushes, the inside of bends, cattle drinks, snags and flooded fields. Side streams are excellent places to head to in a flood and will probably provide easier fishing conditions if you're less than certain. Fishing far out in a flooded river is about as pointless as owning a chocolate teapot. Most of the fish will be found on the inside in the steadier water, just waiting it out like you would. Whilst you might well consider float fishing in still or gently moving flood swims, most of the time you'll probably be ledgering. Use enough lead to comfortably hold bottom in the conditions and try to cast underarm. Try to feel how the lead lands. Does it bump down? If it does, there's a very good chance you're on a firm bottom and in with a decent chance of a bite. A simple running ledger rig should suffice. There's no need for anything sophisticated in a flood. But what about baits? Certain baits have a great track record in a flood, chief among them being lobworms. Yes, folks, it's a throwback to the old days when we used to gather our own bait from nature and they don't come any better than the good old-fashioned lobworm. A single worm or even a bunch of worms will tempt floodwater barbel, bream, chub and perch if you can find them. Bread's a cracking bait at any time of the year and it works really well for roach, chub, bream and dace in coloured water too. A pinch of flake is just the job. Try a 50p size piece on a size 6 for chub and bream But if you want roach and dace, why not try a 10p size pinch on a size 10 or a 12? In a flood, using a bait with more aroma is a really good tactic. But baits don't have to reek, especially of chemical flavours, to be effective. Remember that the fish can find fairly bland baits like bread in coloured water, so don't overdo it and stick to the natural flavours. Classic flood water baits include luncheon meat, cheese paste and boilies, pellets and paste. In other words, baits with a distinctive flavour that will work in even the most filthy water. Breaking the baits open, revealing the inside works really well with boilies and luncheon meat, which I tend to fish in rough chunks with the edges chobbled off to release more scent. So there you have it, my whistle stop tour of fishing in a flood. It's not easy, no one said it is. But hey folks, it looks like it's going to be a fact of life, so we might as well all get used to it and better at it. I hope that next time when you go out fishing in a flood, you'll be less intimidated. Moving on, it's time for Every Picture Tells a Story, and this time around the iconic image that I've chosen from my archives is a shot of the Duke holding his £44 carp he caught from the Monument Fishery while we were filming there for one of our TV shows. Of all the moments in our joint fishing careers, when I meet anglers at shows and exhibitions, this is the one that gets mentioned time and time again. I think that what makes this picture so special is the look on the Duke's face. I think that we've all been there when we've caught a really special fish and having that otherworldly sense of being slightly outside your body or maybe getting into the bath with your socks on. In any event, you're kind of experiencing life through a filter. People speak to you and you respond, but your mind's elsewhere. It's soaring. It's that moment when you know that fishing is special and that there's nothing else quite like it, that it's got a place in your life that you literally cannot replace. Only fishing can bring moments like this. And unless you've experienced it, I can't really describe it for you. So to complete the picture, here's the backstory straight from the horse's mouth. I'm with Mick at the moment and we're actually fishing at the lake but we've taken a little bit of a break and one thing I wanted to remind you about and perhaps you could tell everyone listening about was that amazing carp that you caught from the monument when we were filming that time. I can remember it like it was yesterday really. I mean you know you don't catch many fish like that. When when you're a part-time carp angler like me you know I mean that is the fish of a lifetime and of course, I didn't expect it. I don't think anybody expects to catch a fish that big. 
But we were on a venue where there, there were some, you know, big fish. And I don't think there was one that big supposed to be in there. I think it had actually grown on for a lot of weight on. But, but I mean, the way the story went, I mean, we, we were filming and uh, we were trying really hard, but we had, had a lean time. The lights go in. And then we, we'd move swim. And I remember we kept seeing this big fish rolling. And, and you kept saying, that is a very big fish, Mick. And I said, oh... I'm going to cast to it. So, you know, I was quick off the mark. And do you remember, I made up a, a bag, checked me rod joints. I thought, I'm either going to break this rod or reach it. And I whacked the bait out. And it's going out. And it's just landing where the fish was. And then the bag, for some reason, burst in the air. And you said, well, fine, <laughs> fine mess you made of that. Anyway, we settled down and um, we're having a cup of coffee. And I remember after about, it wasn't that long after, was it? You said to me, is your... Is your tip just bouncing a bit on the right hand rod? I said, Do you know it's pulled round and it's not come back? I reckon a fish has picked that up and it's probably trying to shake the rig out of its mouth. And I picked it up and oh my god, I mean, I won't tell you what it felt like. And I thought, I'm gonna have a bit of fun with Hazy. I've never told you this, haven't I? I thought, I'll have a bit of fun with Hazy because do you remember not long before we'd had a big and about 39 pounds? And I thought he feels like that one again. So I was being a bit nonchalant. Oh, it's a 20, it's a 20. And I'm thinking, oh my God, it's bigger than that. It's got halfway back and I'm, I had to say something because you think, why is he spending that time on a 20? Might be a 30. And I'm thinking, it's bigger than that. And then when you saw it and it rolled and you said, oh my God, he said, it's a monster. It's over 40, mate. And, and, I, and I, I believed you because you've seen 40 pound carp and, just a, a mouth you could get two golf balls in and and when it went in the net I knew it, it was bigger than the one I'd had the other night and uh, do you remember I went to pieces I, I'm like a little kid do you know to, to fish for all the years I have and still get excited like that you know I've never caught a bigger one since probably never will but uh, you know for us to capture it on film and show everybody I, oh, those are the days mate one of the nice things about this podcast is that it's a fishing scrapbook into which I can paste all manner of fishing topics and ideas. Now, few things get me more excited about my fishing than new lures. I love new lures. The breathtaking scope of designs, colours and swimming actions. Staying one step ahead of the fish is important wherever you fish with artificials because fish will wise up to them. Now the lure that's piqued my attention recently is the new snap jig from Berkeley. Both the Duke and myself are long time fans of this brand. We've used their hard and soft plastic baits for over 25 years and their braided lines are essential in our lure fishing. The snap jig however is exceptional by even Berkeley standards and I can see how it's going to catch me a pile of perch, pike and zander in the coming months and years. This is a jig style lure designed to be fished with soft plastic baits, but it has a major design innovation that gives the lure a unique action. Here's my first impressions while checking out the lure on the Warwickshire Avon when fishing with the Duke. This is a really interesting product. It's brand new and it's made by Berkeley. It's called a snap jig. And the reason that I think that this thing, which looks slightly unusual, is significant is because with lure fishing, there's no doubt in my mind that fish do wise up to lures and the way they recognise danger in a lure is by the action. And the point with the jig is that generally speaking, it fishes on a vertical basis. So you lift it off off the bottom and then it falls back down head first and fish usually grab it on the way down. So that hang time between the point where the lure rises and then falls to the bottom is really important. Hence the snap jig because the clever people at Berkeley have made this thing. So instead of going straight up and straight down, this one will go up and then glide off at a much shallower angle, provided that you rig it right. The hardware is excellent. 
The hook is excellent. The whole thing is robustly made, but it's this vein which causes this lure to behave in a different manner. And the other thing you'll notice is the eyelet on the back. And the idea behind the eyelet is that if you want to rig in a stinger hook, you can do that. You might be wondering, how on earth is that thing going to catch fish? Well, and as you can see, it's a very nice, interesting looking lure. And because of that planing action where the lure actually has bigger hang time, it catches a lot of wary fish that a regular jig star lure won't. So it's a very, very exciting product. And I think these are going to produce a good few fish for me in the coming years. Well, I think that you all agree that the snap jig is a really exciting new product, and I'm tempted to say that it has the potential to be a game changing lure. You know, one of the things that's contributed enormously to my enjoyment of the sport over the years has been my mates. Not only have I shared shining moments with them, I've delighted in their company and I've learned stuff from them too. I love fishing alone at times, but there are many occasions when sharing the fishing with a close mate has made the day even more special. I'm sure that you've got a regular fishing partner and in that case, you'll know all about the banter and how much fun it can be. Of course, most of you associate me with Mick and no mention of fishing friends would be complete on my part without talking about the Duke. But there have been others, many others, that have joined me on the journey. My earliest mentors were my grandfather on my mum's side, Dave Massey, and my dad. In truth, my dad's always been my best fishing friend and hero. And while he's very happy to tell people that he taught me everything that I know, those boyhood fishing trips with him, both my granddad's and my uncle Colin, made a huge impression on me and ultimately helped shape my life. Most weekends would see us fishing somewhere in the Midlands, on canals, ponds and park lakes. We fished like crazy when we went on family holidays, fishing club matches. Heck, we just fished whenever and wherever we could, and we loved it. As a kid, I used to read my granddad's copy of the Angling Times, and I was transfixed by the catch pictures of fish, many species of which were just a dream to me at the time. I marvelled at the beautiful paintings of fish by Linsell and David Carl Forbes. Their depiction of fish in their underwater world was enchanting and mysterious, causing me to long and yearn to clap eyes on the real thing and see some of these fish for myself. As a boy used to catching gudgeon and the odd perch, the prospect of catching bream and tench was, well, it was mouth-watering. I can still remember the smell of my granddad's shed when I closed my eyes. Creosote and keep net wax is probably the best way to describe it for those of a certain vintage. In the shed were all sorts of marvels, homemade spinners, floats and flies, even bread maggots there in a biscuit tin with a hole in the lid in which he used to place offal and bran and grow on the biggest, fattest white maggots I've ever seen. Nowadays, if I was asked to put together the perfect fishing team to take on all comers, any method, any place, I'd fill that team with my mates. Some of you may or may not have heard of some or all of them, but trust me, the anglers I'm going to pick out are accomplished all-rounders on whom I'd call if I had to stake my house on someone else catching a fish. The first person to truly influence my professional fishing career was a chap called Stuart Allen. Stu and myself are still close almost 30 years later and we've enjoyed many, many fishing trips together. It was Stu who taught me to fish for bigger fish, specimen hunting as it was known back in the day. Up until that time I'd been strictly a pleasure fisherman and the idea of deliberately targeting trophy fish was, it was intriguing but didn't seem very likely. But both mine and Stu's favourite fish at the time was chub and it was for Big Chub that he first taught me to fish. I've never forgotten those lessons, and I've never lost my love of the species either. Instead of trotting a maggot, I was more likely to impale a lump of bread flake or cheese paste on a big hook. And as the years went by, our fishing adventures took us all over the UK, and even to far-flung corners of the globe such as Florida and Tobago. Now, I wouldn't regard Stu as a particularly technical fisherman, 
but his watercraft, that ability to look at the water, sniff the air and know exactly where to fish is without parallel in my book and experience. His instincts are simply the best. And now for the engine of the team. Ed Scoots Brown, a friend of over 20 years, has also fished all over the planet with me and we both share a huge passion for all forms of fishing. Fly lure and bait, freshwater or salt, me and Ed are happy to fish either. Ed's the most focused fisherman I've ever met. He fishes every cast with confidence and concentration, whether he's fly fishing, lure fishing, shipping out the long pole or chucking a feeder. Of all the anglers I've met, Ed has the engine and the grasp of technique that make him a formidable proposition as far as fish are concerned. And then we have Rich Lee, Dicky, ex-editor-in-chief of Angling Times and truly accomplished angler. Rich is up there with the best of them for his grasp of the technical side of fishing and a mastery of a whole variety of fishing techniques. I've yet to see Rich phased by any form of fishing and like the others, he's a natural. Finally, the Duke. A man who has my utmost admiration and respect. A fine and experienced angler. Mixed skill comes from the fact that he's able to second guess fish behaviour according to the prevailing conditions. With predatory fish, his instincts are uncanny and Mick always seems to know what to do, no matter what the conditions. And yet, he's a fine all-round angler with a similar understanding of fish outside the predatory range. Add to that the humour, the stories and the banter and you'd be very hard pushed to find a better fishing companion. Who would be in your perfect fishing team? Hopefully it will include a few of your mates among the experts, but it's a fun thing to think about. Okay folks, so now we come to that part of the podcast where we're going dark. No pictures or video clips with this one, just a good old fashioned bedtime fishing story and the rest is left to your imagination. The story I've chosen this week is from my book Red Letter Days. Hope you enjoy it. For my grandfathers, Dave Massey and Lou Hayes. They taught me not only how to fish, but also to remember where I came from. Chapter 1. Huge Ooze Chub on the Best of Days I've enjoyed some great days chasing River Ooze Chub, but my most recent session ranks as the most enjoyable. It was a day when years spent hunting ooze chub, refining methods, techniques, bait and locating the biggest fish finally paid off. For a long time, I've realised that the largest chub in any stretch of river often live in the most unlikely swims. The prospect of forsaking classic chub swims in favour of fishing long, featureless runs is a daunting one, but is very rewarding for those who are prepared to do it. Over the years I've targeted these areas with occasional success, but the catalyst to achieving incredible chub fishing has been the invention of a truly classic bait. Arrived at over a period spanning almost a decade of ooze chubbing, this paste is so appealing to chub that I am 100% confident that if it is introduced into a swim containing them, they will eat it. The session had been planned a long way in advance, My good friend Gareth Owens spends his winter running a bar for snowboarders and skiers in the Alps, but he's also a fishing fanatic and he returns to England every February for a few days fishing. Gareth's return this year coincided with the best conditions for chub we have seen this winter. The ooze was fining off, carrying a tinge of colour and the water temperature was rising all the time. I simply knew that every chub in the ooze would be feeding. It was worth taking a gamble by targeting the huge fish that I suspected lived in the long, featureless straits. We arrived at the river in ideal conditions. A stiff wind was blowing, and despite the fact that this would make the fishing a little less pleasurable, I knew it would give big, wary old fish the confidence to venture into open water. Armed with my special cheese paste, I felt confidence growing by the minute and I had no hesitation in targeting the long, open, featureless swims on the fishery. Gareth, who had travelled a long way to fish, would focus on swims with a track record for producing chub, such as those adorned with overhanging trees, creases and pools. If ever there was a day to catch big chub, this was it. But having the best bait for the job wasn't enough to guarantee success. I knew tactics would be the deciding factor. 
I'd already decided to focus on swims that I'd fished casually on previous visits without catching chub. If these swims were going to produce, I had to give the fish the opportunity to see the bait. My approach was to resist the temptation to fish. I wanted to pre-bait several areas with the pace before even putting a line in the water. For three hours I wandered around the river, savouring the atmosphere and struggling to keep my enthusiasm to fish my pre-baited swims under control. I pre-baited each of my six swims on three occasions. On the first visit, I deposited six lumps of paste in the middle of the river, figuring that baiting mid-river would allow chub living on either bank the chance to find the bait. These fish, I was sure, were tucked up in secret places, the sort of places that could not be guessed at by looking at the river. But it is a fact that chub, more than any other fish, are immediately aware of any disturbance to their environment. They're attuned to detecting the arrival of natural food as it drops into the water from overhanging cover or gets swept down the swim on the current. On a day when conditions dictated the fish would be at their most active, the arrival of the pace would be detected by every chub in the swim. The confidence trick was reinforced by two further introductions at hourly intervals of four more lumps of paste on each visit. In between these pre-baitings, I headed well downstream to target a spot renowned for its resident perch. Trotting a piece of worm, I was hopeful of bagging a big stripey while I waited for my chub swims to mature. In a precursor to what was in store for later in the day, the only fish I got was a chub of four pounds from a swim where I've never even seen the species in the past. This only fuelled my enthusiasm for attacking the cheese paste baited swims and by early afternoon I was ready to see if my patient plan had paid off. Disappointingly the fishing got off to a slow start. I spent half an hour in the first swim without raising so much as a sniff. Fishing swims further up river, Gareth had caught chub of 12 ounces and two and a half pounds. I moved to my second baited swim, an open glide with a bed of rushes on the far bank, and after flicking a bait out mid-river, the quiver tip had barely settled when my Avon rod was bending through to the corks. The first fish of the session, a fat four-pounder, had made a mistake, and I couldn't have been more pleased. I decided to take a break for a few minutes and wandered up river to chat with Gareth, nibble on a sandwich and enjoy a cup of coffee. While we were chatting, he impaled a lump of the special paste on a size 4 hook and flicked it into a crease that meandered diagonally across the river. The response was almost instant. The bait settled, the tip tensioned and then whipped into a tight curve. Five pounds six ounces. What a fish! Yet even as I gazed at that fat old chub with its bull-like shoulders and silver scales, there was better to come. I returned to the straight, dropped some more paste into the swims and settled into area number three. This time, the mid-river bait was not seized instantly. The first cast made to the head of the swim produced no response. After 10 minutes, I wound in, rebaited the hook, and dropped the pace bait further down the run. The response this time was not long in coming, and savage in the extreme. As the tip flew round, I had to catch the rod butt as it shot upward like a cruise missile. I knew from the moment I hooked the chub that it was a very big fish. It stormed around the swim, shaking its head, making repeated rushes for every escape route. When I netted the fish, the rod was at full compression and the line was whining like a neutered cat. It slid over the rim of the net grudgingly, its huge flank exposed to the rays of light that broke through low cloud and flooded the landscape with golden light. Even before I weighed the fish, a thin perfect chub with not a blemish to mar its perfection, I knew it would top six pounds. At six pounds, six ounces, it was a fantastic fish and cued massive celebrations. With the afternoon almost over and giving way to early evening, I knew that far from being over, the session was about to reach its climax. In the distance I saw Gareth stoop to dip his landing net and a flash of silver was clearly visible through the hoisted black mesh. I dropped some more bait in the swim. Lightning could not strike twice, could it? Gareth's fish weighed £4.1 one ounce, and on his very next cast was followed by another specimen weighing exactly another pound more. 
I'll never forget this day, he grinned, as I clicked away with the camera, and I knew that neither would I. For a while we sat and chatted, keen to make the most of one of those special fishing days that come so rarely. I then returned to the baited run, settled into swim number four and made my play. Again the pace was seized instantly by a perfectly formed £3.12 ounce chub. I slipped it back, admiring the dark edges that defined its immaculate fins and the broadness of the back suggesting that in the future it would become a huge fish. By the time I was ready to revisit the glide that had produced my £6 chub, I had already added another of £4.12 ounces to my tally. I made the cast right on dusk and settled back to study the eerie glow of the isotope attached to the quiver tip. Very big chub are often loners and the prospects of a brace are usually slim. Nonetheless, I made a second cast, this time dropping the bait further down the run. After touching down, the three swan shot link ledger tickled the gravel on the riverbed and sent rapid vibrations through the quiver tip as the split shot trundled across in a tight arc. The bait came to rest around halfway across the river, some 20 yards downstream. I settled into my low chair, poured a coffee and concentrated on the tip. Five minutes later, the isotope edged forward and dropped back just a fraction. It was a bite, of that there was no question, and I began to suspect that the culprit was displaying the subtlety of an old chub that had witnessed the disappearance of its companion. I resisted the temptation to wind in and remained alert for further signs of action. A minute later, another pluck sent my rod arm twitching, but I fought the urge to strike and waited. Then it happened. Slowly at first, the tip eased forward and dropped back, pulling into a gentle curve. On instinct I struck and grunted with satisfaction as the rod bent into a solid curve. In the gloom a huge vortex appeared on the surface and then the resounding slap of a tail slammed the water in defiance. After almost jumping out of the water, the irresistible weight on the end of the line surged for the far bank. Jarring bumps judded up the line as the angry fish shook its head and then without warning the line went slack. I cranked like crazy as I sought to regain contact. Thankfully the line came tight again and I breathed a sigh of relief before uttering a string of curses as the fish dived under my feet, intent on entangling itself in soft weed. I leaned into the chub, piled on the pressure and hauled it back into the open water. I quickly scooped my prize into the net. It was a fitting climax to a fabulous fishing session. Silver moonlight outlined the silhouette of two dark figures as first a mesh sling was hoisted onto the scales and then the dim torchlight on the dial revealed a reading of six pounds one ounces and eight drams. The figures shook hands and punched the air in triumph. The cries of jubilation that rang down the Ouse Valley were accompanied by celebratory flashes, not of fireworks but of a camera working overtime at the end of a fantastic fishing day. So that brings to an end another Fishing Tales podcast. If you've enjoyed the pod so far and you're keen for more, please remember to subscribe and tell your friends. I know that everyone asks you to do it, but believe me, if it wasn't important, I wouldn't ask. In the meantime, with the river season coming to an end, it's time to look ahead to spring and the possibility of some upcoming carp and tench fishing. Delicious. Until next time, tight lines and wet nets.